silence. Do not hold your peace or be still, O oh God. So the title of this message today is Silent Truth. Silent Truth. In his book, When You're All Out of Blues, Ken Jones writes about a lesson he learned one day at the office. And this is written from his perspective. He said, when I walked into my office, I noticed something I had never seen before. It was round about the size of a dessert plate and plugged into the wall, giving out a constant noise. It wasn't a loud noise, just constant. What in the world is that thing? I thought as I stopped to stare. I finally asked the receptionist about it. She said, it's an ambient noise generator. If it's too quiet in here, we can distinguish the voices in the counseling offices, and we want to protect their privacy. So we bought the noise generator to cover the voices. Her explanation made perfect sense to me, but didn't it have to be louder to match the conversations I asked? No, she said. The constant of the sound tricks the ear so that what is being said can't be distinguished. Interesting, I thought. Very interesting. One kind of noise to cover the sound of another. It made me think and pray. No wonder, Lord. No wonder I strain to hear what you have to say to me. The constants of sound, little noises, soft, inward, ambient thoughts and fears and attitudes <clears throat> tricks the ear of my inner man and mash your still small voice. You want to hear the voice of God over all the other sounds or voices that are running through my head. At times, there are times where the phone ringing drowns out the voice of God. At times, uh, 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 my lack of income drowns out the voice of God. Other times, the voice of inadequacy or a lack of self-esteem fill my mind feed, and that drowns out the voice of God. The concerns of my family become louder than the voice of God. But at other times, since I've gotten older, there are times that God is silent. When we need a word from the Lord, sometimes God is silent. When we need an answer from the throne of grace, sometimes God is silent. When we need a word of hope in a hopeless situation, sometimes God is silent. When we need a message of mercy in a messed up set of circumstances, sometimes God is silent. When we need a grace note to transpose the jangling discords and dissonance that are heard all around us, a grace note to transpose all of that into the harmonious symphony of what does not appear, God is silent. When we want to say, when we want God to say something, anything, yes or no, maybe so, not now, wait a while, by and by, God is silent. God conceals himself and sometimes he makes himself known to us just as much, if not more, in the concealing as he does in the revealing. In fact, I'm convinced that one of the things God wants us to learn from from those times of silence is that God is doing some revealing of himself and the concealing of himself. He is both imminent and transcendent, both revealed and concealed. There's been moments to where in I've been asking myself, where is God in this situation? When September 11th happened, I said, why is God silent? When I got the news report about Trayvon Martin, I said, why is God silent? Silent. When, 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 when I can't seem to make ends meet and I'm doing all that I can and I'm working day and night, I ask myself, why is God silent? When I can't give the answers to my children that I want or I can't save them how I want, sometimes I go to God and say, why aren't you talking to me? Sometimes God gives us the silent treatment. You say, well, I don't know what you're talking about, Pastor Sin. I don't get the sign of treatment. But you know, you have to realize that we're in a relationship with God. And sometimes in relationships, things can get really bad. Sometimes in relationships, you know how it is to where you walk into the house and you know that you have a companion there, but for whatever reason, they're not talking to you 
and you're not talking to them, but you all are just walking through the house and you what? Silent. You become roommates. And if you've never been in a relationship to where you can walk in and you go to your space and they go to their space, just hold on and keep on living and keep on relationship. Okay? <laughs> I know that's not a word. Okay? <laughs> I'll tell my mother I use that word because she sent me to the best schools to learn better, but it just sounded good. <laughs> you know how it is to where you can walk in and you know that there's tension in the air. You don't want to be touched. There's those things that you do to where in, you can lay beside someone and never touch them all night. Don't cross that line. We're going to divide these sheets. You stay on your side, I stay on my side. And please don't let a leg or a toe to roll over and touch you. You snatch it right back. <laughs> Some of y'all act like y'all don't know what I'm talking about. Get so, uh, into a relationship and then come talk to me or Tommy. We'll tell you about some time where there's tension in the air. There can be tension to where and God is silent, to where you don't even think that God is hearing your prayer. I prayed to God so earnestly, but I've never gotten a response. I've sent a text message to God, and he didn't respond. I picked up the phone and called, and he didn't answer. And sometimes I think God has forgotten about little old me. So the question has to be asked. What can be learned from those times when God decided? You haven't reached the point to where in you dialed into your Christianity and seems that like your Christianity tank is on empty. There's going to come a point to where in you're going to find yourself in a situation to where in there are no answers. We want our question answered. We want our problem solved. And at some point, we live in a society where we want everything quick. We want everything fast. We don't want to stand in the bank line so we go to the ATM. When we go to the grocery store, we don't want to stand in the line so we have self-checkout. My wife is a professional self-checkout her. <laughs> Every time I go, I swipe my groceries. Nah, it gives this negative symbol, so I get frustrated. So I just stand in the line like everybody else. <laughs> She said, go to the self-checkout. No, it doesn't work for me. She said, well, give me the groceries. I'll go. And then she checks out. She's standing at the front. She said, I told you to come to the self-checkout. Okay, great. <laughs> Next time, I'll trust you. <laughs> Everything is fast. When you get on the freeway, you have fast tracks. Because you don't want to deal in the traffic. So if you got a fast track, you just click it on and you get in the fast track lane so you can go where you want. Everything is so fast. We don't want to be patient. So what happens? What happens when God is silent? What happens when God doesn't respond? The first point, if you take taking notes, I suggest you write this down. Because this week, God is going to be silent. I don't know where that came from. The Holy Spirit laid it in my heart to tell someone in this room, God is going to be silent on you this week. And he don't want you to be mad. The first point is frustration. When God is silent, frustration sets in. Frustration is heavy for the simple fact that when you get frustrated, you, 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 you become angry. Because then everything bothers you. You become irritable. Frustration sets in because it's an agitation. Frustration is those moments to where in things don't go the way you want them to go. Things don't work out the way that you want them to work out. When you plan and you plan and you plan and you do exactly based on the plan and it still doesn't happen, frustration comes. So our first point is frustration. And how, how do we deal with frustration? How do, we, how do we battle with the simple fact that when God is silent, we get frustrated? Well, the first lesson is this. It's frustrating to want answers for life's most difficult questions and not to have those answers for life's most difficult questions and not to have those answers for coming. It's frustrating to get knocked down like Job, strung up like Jesus, picked on like I, Elijah, messed over like some of you have been. It gets frustrating to expect God's help and instead get only a holy hush. It gets frustrating to expect solace and instead get silence. It gets frustrating to hear no explanation and to be left alone in silence to try to figure out 
are feeling. It is frustrating to try to piece together in your own mind what it is that you're going through, to understand what it is that is happening to you and why it is you that are feeling that way, while, while wondering all at the same time, where is God and what is God doing and why isn't he answering anything? How did God let this happen in the first place? Some of us in our relationship with God, we have a genie mentality. We just think that we're supposed to stand before God and say, okay, God, I got three things that I need you to get done for me today, brother. This is what I need you to do. Um, look here, man. By the time I get to the ATM, I need some money. Okay, that's the first thing. The second thing is, this person that I'm with, either they're going to act right or I'm out of here. Okay. The third thing is, when I get to that job, that supervisor says one thing to me, I need you to shut her down. <laughs> okay, you got that? Okay. I'm going to go get a shower, I'm going to put my clothes on by the time I get the car hat up, so thank you very much. <laughs> we want to treat God like he's a genie. I understand that we are taught in the old church that he's a problem solver, but nobody said that he had to work on your time frame. He parted the Red Sea from Moses, but first of all, Moses had to get there and find out that he couldn't do it himself. Yeah. Some of us don't want to go through the process of the problem. We want God just to solve the problem, but sometimes God has to take us through the process. If you're a parent, sometimes you just have to be quiet and let your children do exactly what they're going to do. I was asked the other day, how do you keep your kids from doing such and such? Sometimes I just shut up. Because <laughs> at some point I've talked all that I can talk. I've taught you everything that I got. I've given you the best that I have. But if you choose to go in the opposite, opposite direction, then at that point, I'm sorry. My grandmother taught me a long time ago, and she came out of Arkansas. She said, sometimes the best teacher is that bought experience. When I was young, I didn't understand what she was talking about until I went off to college and I bumped my head into a brick wall and found out that it hurt. <laughs> Sometimes you got to reach for the hot pot to find out that it truly is hot. Oh. Sometimes God wants you to go through the process and God is quiet because he wants you to accept and appreciate the experience. Now I know that that's tough to do because when you're going through the process, you just want the problem solved. You get frustrated because you feel like you're the only person going through that problem. But I stop by to tell you that you may not have the place that you want to stay, but at least you're not homeless. You may not have all the money that you want, but at least you are not in a situation to where you had to eat down at the soup kitchen last night. Come on, somebody. You may not be with who you want to be with, but at least you're with someone that you at least like sometimes. <laughs> Love can fade in and out, but if I like it, I have it. Tommy and Michelle and, and me and Karen are going to do a relationship conference where Karen will tell you there's a whole lot of things that she's not going through the process. They're not always going to be what you like. You're not always going to get what you want. But at some point when you get frustrated, frustration brings about change. Because if you get frustrated enough, you're going to sit down and pay attention to the details on how not to be frustrated the next time. So sometimes God gets quiet because he has to frustrate you. Because see, we get too comfortable. Yes, we do. If every day, if every day was hot and sunny and beautiful weather, we wouldn't know how to act. You see it because we live in Los Angeles. Let the clouds roll in and then all of a sudden we start complaining, oh, it's, it's cold around here. Where's the sun? Jesus. Lord, bring the sun and when he brings it, oh, it's hot. <laughs> Oh my God, this heat is killing me. Can we get some water? Then when it rains, oh my God, this rain. I can't go to work today. Folks, I can't go to work. We're in constant complaint mode. <laughs> because we do, because things are not to our liking. We don't like certain things. We, don't, we, we want everything to be turned toward us. realize that when Adam and Eve had sinned in the Garden of Eden, the 
that there was a moment to where God was silent. If you read the text, it wasn't that Adam and Eve fought, fell, and then God said, Adam, where are you? No, there was a moment of silence. Do you realize that, 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 that when Moses was leading the people from Pharaoh, there was a moment to where God was silent? Do you realize that Jeremiah is called a weeping prophet because he kept crying out to God because it was too difficult, but God wasn't responding? realize that when Jesus was hanging on the cross one of the, one of the seven sayings he said is my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because God his daddy, his father was silent. Now if God can go silent on Jesus why do you expect that he got to talk to you? Frustration. We get frustrated. And sometimes frustration brings about a change. You get frustrated enough on your job, what are you going to do? Start looking for another. You get frustrated enough in your relationship, what are you going to do? You're going to start working on it. Maybe we need counseling. You get frustrated enough with, 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 with your children, what are you going to do? You're going to sit down and find out, well, why, why are we frustrated with each other? What is it that I can do to be a better parent? And can I share with you maybe how you can work with me on being what I want you to be as my son and daughter? Frustration. Second point, communication. 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 You say, well, hold on, Pastor. If you said the title of the message is silent treatment, how are we communicating if God is silent? Glad you asked. The definition of communication is a process by which information is exchanged between individuals through a common system of simple signs or behavior. When we think of communication, we don't typically think about it being in the same conversation as silence. Communication is not just verbal. It can be nonverbal. Like the body language of your partner when they are upset with you. It can be written like you receive a text message from someone, someone that when you call them, they don't answer. Communication is something in our current day and age that is different than it was before. We have Facebook, we have Twitter, we have Instagram, we have Snapchat. <laughs> our communication with God is limited due to a living in society that is overloaded with noise. We are a noisy society. We wake up in the morning, we gotta turn on Good Morning America or the Today Show. We get in the car, we gotta play our music loud, we listen to Steve Harvey, we listen to the weather station, we gotta have all of this noise. Then when we get out of the car, we got to put our earphones in to listen to our songs on our phone and our iPad. I know what I'm talking about. My beautiful daughter does it all the time. I don't know what I say, Courtney. 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 I go in the room, she has her earphones in because she's drowning us out. We live in a very noisy society. Sometimes God is trying to communicate with you, but it's not that he's not talking to you, it's just that you're not listening. You're not listening because you're too noisy. We have to have constant information coming at us on a daily basis. If you really want to hear from God, get in the car sometimes and don't turn on the radio. If you really want to hear from God, have an area in your home to where you don't have a TV, you don't have a radio. Cut the cell phone off and stand there and listen for the voice of God. A lot of times God is communicating with you, but the simple fact is you don't know his voice. What do you mean I don't know his voice? You don't know his voice because you haven't heard him because you know the voices of everything else. I can walk on campus and there can be a whole lot of children out on the playground. But over all those children, I've always been able to recognize each one of my kids' voices. Why? Because I know their voice. I can walk into a room full of kids and I can call out Courtney, Kalita, Isaiah and they will respond. Why? Because they know my voice. This is an honest, introspective look at yourself. Do you know what God sounds like? 
I know you know what, 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 the, what the TV reporters sound like. I know you know what the political pundits sound like. I know you know what your favorite radio show host sounds like, but do you know what God sounds like? When God came to Adam in the garden and they were trying to find leaves to cover themselves because they had sinned, God said, Adam, where are you? Adam didn't ask the question, who is that that's looking for me? Because he had a relationship with God, therefore when he heard God's voice, he knew who was asking him the question. <clears throat> the best way for God to communicate with some of us is to get us to the point to where we could drown out the noise. And sometimes the silent treatment is the best communication of all. Someone can tell you something so plainly nice. And I'm the kind of person that will say, it's not so much what you say, it's how you say it. You can tell me, could you, could you come over here and move this chair? But if your body language tells me, could you come over here and move this chair? <laughs> Hey, the chair might not get moved. Right I feel some type of way about how you talk to me right there. Sometimes we can get text messages, and text messages and emails, I think, are some of the worst yes. ways to try to have a discussion. Because the person on the other end is going to receive that totally different than the way that you sent it. I've sent text messages, somebody called me, Why are you, what are you talking about? I'm like, wait a minute, I just text to say, well, we still meet for lunch. Why are you getting so, why are you getting so irritable? Well, it's how you text me. Well, how did the text, how did you read the text? See, the thing with, with, the thing with emails and text messages are, you're reading them in your own voice. You're not reading them in the voice of the person that sent it. So if you have issues on your end as far as the receiver, it may not be how the center meant for it to come across. That's why sometimes you gotta go the old fashioned way. Like my dad tells me, don't send me stuff, don't send me a picture in email, don't send me a picture on text message. He wants me to take a Polaroid picture, get it developed, and send it to him so he can hold it. He's so precious. I love him, he's so precious. No, no, I said, Dad, you get the, I sent you a text message with a picture of the kid. Mm -mm, I didn't get that. <laughs> I don't even know how to do that on that phone. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, just uh, you and Karen get it developed and send it to me. I need actual pictures. Yes, sir. <laughs> so we run over to the, to the little Kodak station at the Sam's Club, Costco's, get it developed, send it to them. Yeah, that is what I'm talking about. <laughs> pictures that I can hold and see. Yes, sir. <laughs> Sometimes you just need to pick up the phone and call. Sometimes when you communicate with God, stop doing it while you're in the shower, or while you're pumping gas, or while you're trying to text someone. Stop, focus, pay attention, and give God his time. Because you're in a relationship with God, and nobody likes to be in a relationship to where someone is not giving you full attention. Have you ever tried to talk to somebody that they're trying to work on their phone, and you're trying to, you're trying to tell them something, and you're just like, okay, I'm going to stop talking because you're not paying attention to me. Communication is very key. Communication is something that God sometimes does, and he's not going to necessarily speak it to you. Sometimes he doesn't speak in the earthquake. Sometimes he doesn't speak in the storm. But out of the whirlwind and the still small voice that you can't hear when there is a lot of noise around you. Third point, so we've dealt with frustration. We've dealt with communication. Now, third and final point, this is a zinc. Anticipation. God's silence is about anticipation. The beauty of Christmas is not so much that once we get older, we really find out what Christmas is all about and what it represents. <laughs> the anticipation that a child has that Christmas is always coming. It seemed like when I was a kid, Christmas took 24 months to get here. <laughs> Seemed like it took two years for Christmas to come around. Now that I'm grown and that I have children that have wish lists, <laughs> that have very expensive things on it, seems like Christmas comes every other month. <laughs> seems like Christmas is like Addisonville, it comes every month. <laughs> Didn't we just have Christmas? Mm-hmm. But it's here again, I know. 
depressing, isn't it? Anticipation. God is silent so that he can bring out that childlike mentality for you to anticipate what he's going to do. If God brought you through every situation when you wanted him to, how you wanted him to, and, 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 and designed it how you wanted him to bring him out, would you go to him as often as you do? Sometimes God wants you to anticipate the move of God. Take your notes. I want you to write this down. Silence is a shift in your situation. Sometimes you got to realize that things are done in the quiet part. If you've ever lived down south, they have tornadoes. Outside of the tornado, it gets really loud. It's so noisy that you can't even hear. <coughs> They say that once you get into the eye of that tornado, it's total silence. That you can't hear anything. It's just quiet. Somebody is in a tornado situation. Your world on the outside is noisy. Everything is getting torn up. Everything that you try to do doesn't work out. Everything that you want to do don't seem to happen. Those prayers don't seem to be getting answered, but what God is trying to do is he's trying to get you into the center of your storm and allow for you to anticipate his next one. Our thoughts are not his thoughts. Our time is not his time. God doesn't work off of our time. He works off of his time. Therefore, for you, you may have been going through hell for the last nine months. To God, that's only one day. <laughs> His time is not our time. But God wants you to know that in that quiet moment to where you can't hear him speak, that's when you have to anticipate what he's going to do. Because when he, when he shows up, he shows up right on time. He knows exactly how much you can bear. There are some points, and I'm just being transparent, that I go to God and I say, God, I know that I'm a big man. I know I have a lot of dirt. I have broad shoulders, but how much of this can I carry? I can't keep doing this. I can't keep acting like I'm a firefighter and I'm putting out fires and I'm, and I'm showing everybody that I'm okay. But on the inside, I had these moments to where I'm just like a little kid to where I want to cry and I want to run to my mother because I don't want to do this no more. I can't bear this anymore. I'm frustrated. I'm struggling. Nothing seems to work. And it's at that point that God whispers to me and says, what I've given you, I've given to you. Therefore, just like he designs a blessing, he designs your problems too. Because what I'm going through, someone else would have committed suicide by now. What you're going through, Someone else would have turned to, to drugs and alcohol. <laughs> what you're going through, someone else would have decided to clock out a long time ago. But God has designed it especially for you. So you have to wait in earnest and anticipate what he's going to do. He had left you. It seems like in the scriptures it says, God, you are far away. And David is so beautiful because David, I swear he's my first cousin on my mother's side. Because when you read the book of Psalms, you read the book of Psalms from a perspective that David is constantly asking God, where are you? I'm in a psalm season of life. I don't know about you, but I'm in a psalm season of life because I'm asking God, where are you? Why are you quiet? Why are you not speaking? Why are you not showing me? Why are you showing everybody else that, that their blessings are right here? But for some reason, you keep forgetting about mine. You haven't checked in the Cedric. Maybe you haven't gotten to the end section of the house. <laughs> Cedric, now it's okay. I, I, I typically sit toward the back of the class because of my name. You're still dealing with the A, B, and Cs. Okay, I, I got it. You're on the ages now. I said, okay, so now Tommy and Michelle, okay. Ooh, at some point, you're going to get to them ends. <laughs> so I'm anticipating for God to call my name. 
I need to tell someone, don't get out of the line just yet. <laughs> don't get out of the line just yet. He may not be taught, he may not be verbal to you, but he's moving on your behalf. My God, I don't know who that's who that is for, but he's moving on your behalf. He's shifting things in the silent. Sometimes you gotta realize that God is like mama or grandmama that that, that I'll never will forget that that uh, uh, and I remember Karen's grandmother. This is so funny for the simple fact that she was a little short lady. She was a fun-loving lady, but she moved really slow. And we would go to the house. And she would say, "You guys want us to make something?" No, oh, give me that some pain. You know? And she get in there and she just started. Here. Now how she was moving. Like, we're not going to eat until we eat. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not ready to eat. It's Sunday. Okay, maybe we should just go out. <laughs> and before you know it, you get in there, she's moving out of all the place. Before you know it, she done made your eight course meal. You got three meats, four starches, some sun tea, and some lemonade. Sometimes God is moving, and you don't have to make a lot of noise. I want to tell you something. My grandfather told me that an empty wagon makes a whole lot of noise. Sometimes people that do a lot of things quiet, that's why I watch out for quiet people. They don't look so quiet. They don't do anything. Very good. Those ones you have to pay attention to. Anticipate the movement of God. Anticipate that when you get to your Red Sea experience like Moses, and he asks you to stick your staff out, and that Red Sea parts, <laughs> stand back and watch the fulfillment of the Lord. Realize that, like Jeremiah, when God has given you an assignment to go and speak to the people, and you don't think the people are hearing from he carried that cross because he knew we were going to be right here in 2015. And that if I don't get on this cross for, my, for, for, for the people who are coming behind me, then they won't be able to stand against the wrath of my father. So Jesus hung there from the sixth to the ninth hour. To where the sun refused to shine. And those that were standing at the base of, of the cross stood there in anticipation of the son, of the so-called son of God to die. They anticipated his death, but they didn't know when it was coming because Jesus had designed it for him to give up his life and not for them to take it. Anticipation of putting him in a borrowed tomb. Letting him stay there on Friday night. Stay there all day Saturday. Now we're going back to stay there all day Saturday night. But early Sunday morning, with great anticipation, he got up. He got up to show you that you can stand and face tomorrow. Because Jesus Christ lives. There's nothing that this world could ever do to me that is not designed from my Father. Anticipate the next move of God. Don't get depressed. Don't get down. We are moving into the season to wherein things are going to happen. You planted a seed in January that has not grown just yet. <laughs> but the scriptures say plant the seed. All you got to do is plant the seed. Let him do the rest. An oak tree doesn't start out as an oak tree. It starts out as a seed. 14 years ago, they gave us three seeds. Never would, I, would I've ever thought that we would be here today. I want my babies back. <coughs> but they gotta grow up. And as they grow, their growth doesn't have anything to do with me or my wife. It has to do with God. Give your dreams back to God. Give your hopes back to God. Give your children back to God. 
get our situation back to God. My favorite saying is, I don't know when it's going to happen, but it's all going to work itself out. Just deal with the side of the tree for a little while. Anticipate.